Elliot, thank you for taking time being with us today. Tell us a little bit more regarding your background and how did you get into real estate? Um, ooh, uh, what's the short version? Um, I got into real estate completely accidentally. I wasn't planning on it. My background is in aerospace engineering and I was working as an engineer in a corporate setting. Um, let's see, how did the real estate come in? I was trying to find my way out of corporate. I had no idea how to do it. And so I was studying business, real estate, everything for a handful of years and um an opportunity came across my desk one time to start investing so i kind of started doing it really not thinking it was gonna be my ticket out but i started doing it on the side as uh oh there's our notice to do the podcast nailed it um uh let's see so i just kind of started pursuing it as a side thing just do something smart with my money And then one thing kind of led to another and I kept making connections in the industry and suddenly, let's see, five, five, six, seven years later, here I am. I had no idea I was going to end up here. And regarding your first deal, can you guide us through your first deal, how it went down? Well, my first deal was actually something completely different from what I do now. My first deal, uh, interestingly enough, was in Nicaragua, the third world country. Okay. Uh, I got into some pre-construction development and we've all since kind of moved, uh, out from there. And now, uh, all my deals end up being just United States cash flowing rental properties. So that just kind of came through knowing everybody and it just kind of one thing led to another. And regarding the deals, what are you looking for when you, when you have a, a deal, what is a good deal for you that gets your attention and has you start, uh, um, start solving it? Well, the biggest thing for me is cash flow. So that's my number one uh, priority. Like I live in Los Angeles and there's just not cash flow here. Uh, so I look for out of state deals typically. And the couple, the two big things I'm looking for are the numbers. So the cash flow. And then the second thing is the important thing really is whether those numbers are going to be sustainable or not. And a lot of that has to do with the market because somebody can tell you something's going to cash flow all day long, but if the market fundamentals aren't going to support that, then you know, it's just projected numbers and you're not going to be able to sustain it. So I really look for that second part of it, um, which is the uh, sustainability of it. So, yeah. But how do you analyze it? Because uh, I'm a number cruncher and I'm a pretty much a geek. <laughs> Soon a geek. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Power to the geeks. And, yeah. Uh, Yeah, and the, what it looks to me is that the, the uh, cap rates are getting a little bit compressed now and the market's yeah. a little bit high now. So yeah. uh, what are you looking for regarding fundamentals? What type of yields you're looking for? Can you guide us through the process? Well, the big thing for the fundamentals is I want to buy in growth markets. Uh, one of the worst things I could possibly do, in my opinion, is buy in a declining market. Like, for example, a lot of people bought into Detroit And Detroit hasn't had the market fundamentals to sustain everything. Everyone's ended up in a big pickle about it. But the, the market matters because, for instance, if it's a growth market, you're going to continue to have tenants. Your tenant pool is going to be pretty well. And in my experience, the most costly thing about the rental properties are bad tenants. So you want the better tenant pool. You need exit strategy for how you're going to get out of the property if you want to. Uh, you want the values to sustain themselves. And you really need the rental income to itself. So if you're in a declining market and everyone's leaving the town, how are you going to expect your rental income to continue? And especially if you went in with an adjustable rate uh, loan or mortgage or anything, that could be a deathly combination. Um, and, and so I really want... Sure. Go, keep, keep, go on, go on. Okay. Um, what was the second thing you asked? No, uh, I was asking because the cap rates are getting a little bit compressed yeah. now. So I was wondering what, what, what makes a, a deal attractive for you right now? Okay. Um, yeah, the cap rates are standard for what they should be now. Whereas about three, four, five years ago, they were insanely, ridiculously awesome. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, well, now the deals aren't good. Well, <laughs> now the deals are normal. Back then, they were insanely awesome. So, um, you know, with the cap rates compressed, that even further supports the idea of you want to sustain those numbers because you don't have as much of margin to have anything go wrong. And with any rental property, anything can go wrong, of course, and that's why we leave extra estimates for that kind of stuff, repairs, vacancy, all that. But 
you really just want to be able to sustain those numbers. And for, for our European listeners that uh, might not know the US market as well as you do, what is a growth market? What do you, what do you mean when you say it's a growth market or a declining market? Well, the big thing is you want people going to the city and not leaving. So your population number is easily one of the biggest ones. Like if you have a consistently declining population, that's a sign of a declining market. Okay. But what's going to keep the population going up or down? Jobs and industry. So when I go to a market, I don't want just a city that has one big industry because what if something happens to the industry? Like Michigan, for example, was so much about the automobile industry. And then when the automobile industry took a big hit, the entire state took a big hit. So uh, like Atlanta used to be a really popular market and they have multiple industries. Like if one big one crashed, they've got so many other ones to sustain it. So it's really about the jobs, which is directly related, of course, to the industry. But the more jobs you've seen getting created, the better the sign is for the growth. And regarding regarding deal flow, because uh, all of us are connected virtually now, but so if you, if you feel a need to invest outside your market, same thing as, as, as me, because I live in Portugal, how would mm -hmm. you advise our listeners to do it? Because it sounds you're doing pretty much the same thing. So how would you guide our, our listeners to do the same process? I really recommend it's about the teams because when you're not local to something, you have to have trustworthy teams. And I heard so many horror stories back in the day when everybody was buying the turnkeys and buying from out of the country, you know, they really didn't know who they were working with. And so when you don't know that you, there's just a lot of room for things to happen because if people aren't taking care of your property, if they're selling you a property that you don't, that is being advertised falsely, um, so you really want to work with the people that you can trust. And even when you do that, there's still going to be headaches. These guys aren't perfect, but you want the people who have good intentions behind them. So what I usually recommend to people is first ask who people are working with, who have they had a good experience with. And, you know, a lot of people want to do the vetting and figure out who to work with on their own. There's a lot that goes into determining the good teams versus the bad teams. And even I've been in this industry so long and I still don't see the red flags. A lot of times I work with a group of guys who are kind of experts in this field. And occasionally I present them with someone that I've met and they're like, Oh, well, you know, here's a major risk factor. And it wouldn't have even dawned on me to um, consider that. So just realize that if you haven't been doing this, there are people who are a lot smarter than you are and, you know, find those people work with them. And you kind of, you're kind of really building a team. Like it's, it's a leveraging move. The more people that are involved in the equation, the more support you have versus if you just go to some random seller and you buy by yourself and you have no one behind you, no one, anything, you know, how do you even know what you're doing and what's going to stop them from, you know, doing kind of having their way with you. So if you kind of show up with a team, show up with a legit trustworthy team um, and you just kind of build your suitcase full of, good people, you're going to be in a lot better position. And at this time, what type of deals are you looking for? Single families, multi, multis, uh, 20 units, 50 above. What, what are you looking for right now? Well, I only work with residential properties. So one to four units, anything above four units is going to be commercial, which is different financing, different fundamentals, different everything. Um, so within the one to four unit range, the single families obviously are one unit, but then the two to fours, the duplex, the triplex, the fourplex are the multifamily residential properties. And I really don't, uh, I go for any of them. It's really just about the numbers. There's pros and cons of a single family versus multifamily. Um, but when I've kind of weighed them out myself, I've even, if we're both nerds. I love a spreadsheet. Like I've put spreadsheets out and just really weighed the pros and cons of both. And to me, they, they pretty much even out. And some people, you know, some people want a nice suburban single family home and that's completely fine. There's a lot you can do with a single family home and some people just want the multis. The multis are fewer and far more between than they were a few years ago, but they still exist occasionally. Duplexes are pretty easy. Triplexes and fours come every so often now. So at this time, what you're saying, it's, it, it's much easier to find duplexes and fourplexes than it is to find a good, uh, good deal on a multifamily from 20 units above. Is this what you're saying? 
I really can't say one way or another because I haven't looked for the bigger ones, but the difference, the main difference for anyone considering either of them is you're differentiating between the residential label and the commercial label if you get more than four units. And there's just different financing, different uh, management. I don't know what the laws are, but at some point when you have so many units, you have to have an on-site manager, things like that. And the exit strategy for commercial is very different because you're going to sell to another investor and the value of the property is based on the income, whereas residential is based on the market. And that leaves a lot of room sometimes for some problems, but it also leaves a lot of room for really good stuff. And the two things are taxed very differently. Uh, so it's really just two different animals. And I, I just have never really looked into the bigger commercial properties. So I'm not sure. Gotcha. And regarding, regarding the types of properties that you're looking for, is it kind of uh, C types, B types? You're looking forward to a little bit rehab, retouching. What is it that you do when you go into a property, when you well, see it's a good deal? Well, so my niche specifically is turnkey rental properties, which is fantastic for the long distance investors because everything's done for you. Um, I think there's a huge risk factor if you're going to go, if you're going to try and rehab or fix up a house. Um, I tried to rehab a house last summer in Georgia, so 2,200 miles away, and it was horrible. Like, I had to go there. Like, I don't know if you've worked with contractors lately, but oh, my God. Like, it really... It's a hard yeah. thing. So yes, with the turkey is. rental properties, these guys go find the distressed properties, they rehab it for you, they put the tenants in, and they place the property managers. So while I'll never say anything is completely hands-off, it's about as hands-off as you can be. So that's where it comes into finding the good teams, and you don't want to just work with any turnkey provider. But So that's my niche. Everything's done for you. Um, and most of those properties, the good cash flow window is typically between – B plus to C grade properties, ballpark, like high C's, low B's are fantastic. Um, of course, the lower you get in rating, the more risk you're going to take on. Like I don't advocate D's. C minus is a little on the sketchy side. I prefer C plus at a minimum, but you know, the C's may be worth it depending on the deal, but B's are fantastic. Anything a lot of times B plus and certainly anything higher than B plus, you're really not going to see a lot of cash flow on. And when you use turnkey properties, they, they basically are vetting out everything that you need to, to do. So it's kind of a hands-off, right? So, so they, yeah. they screen the tenants, they take care of the property. All you receive is a check. Is, I want to be clear yeah. on this. Yeah, you buy the property. So you own the property and they're managing it for you. And so your job at that point, like you don't want to be completely hands-off. I have a lot of people buy the properties and then they just float off into space and then they wonder when something goes wrong. Like they're not flawless. And property managers, anytime you're a long distance owner, your number one problem is going to be property managers. They're just not the cream of the crop. And so you all, your job, if you buy a turnkey property because they're doing everything else, your job really is to manage that manager. Like you, if everything's going fine and you're receiving your check every month, you know, no big deal. But if anything starts going wrong, you want to put your foot down. You want to figure out what's going on. If you need to fire that manager, you can hire another one. I've done that on all my properties. Um, I've done it all over the phone. So it doesn't even really have to be in person necessarily. But really keeping an eye on things. And even if you're getting a check every month, you may want your manager to go do an inspection of the property. Like you want to make sure your tenants aren't running a drug lab or, you know, that half the roof isn't falling off and they just didn't tell you. I had a tenant one time that uh, from the fireplace, he didn't open the flue. And so smoke just bare, I mean, the entire house was damaged from smoke. It was like a $24,000 rehab at the end of the day. And my property manager never knew about it. The guy was just living in it. And so we kind of found out about it. We're like, wait, what happened? And he had been living in that for a couple months. So, you know, you want to make sure that they're keeping an eye on the property, even if you're getting the money, but just keeping an eye on things and not assuming you don't have to do anything. But when things go great, I mean, I spend maybe, I mean, certainly less than an hour a year talking to my managers and everything's going fine five minutes a year. I mean, it's really, it's pretty minimal, which is fantastic. And j just to just to be clear, so you you use a turnkey provider to they they show you a property, they put a tenant in, but the property manager it's on you. Is this what you're saying? You have to get a property well, manager to get take care of the property. Company, 
there, the property that you buy will come with property management. It may be okay. in-house management for them, or they may use a third party, but it comes with property management. And most people stick with that property manager. It's going to be your property. So you're welcome to interview any managers you want. You don't have to use theirs, but typically when you use theirs, there's some kind of like either a rental guarantee or a scope of work guarantee for a year, you know, just kind of warranties basically. And they're only valid if you use their property manager, but the house will come with property management, but they're the ones you want to keep an eye on. You do want to decide for yourself if you want to use them. And then if anything happens, it is your property, you're the boss. So you can, you're not tied to them by any stretch of the imagination. And regarding, regarding the paperwork, can you, can you guide us through, let, let's say today we just looked at a deal, it sounds fine, so let, let's, buy, let's buy this deal now. How does the paperwork uh, work when you are a, a foreigner like, like I am? It's actually pretty easy. They just send you, like the initial contract is the first thing you'll sign. They'll email it to you, you read over it, you sign it, you scan it, whatever, email it back to them. You'll put uh, typically $5,000 down earnest money in an escrow account. Um, and then after that, uh, I assume, because if you guys are international, you'd be cash deals. Usually if you're using a lender, the lender would then send you the closing packet. Um, in the case of being in the United States, when I've done it, I've gotten the packet FedEx overnight and then a notary has to come in and watch me sign everything. Um, but that is more for the financing end. So you guys, they would probably just, somehow I would get emailed to you. So it's really all just electronic. So, and, and, and after that, uh, how, does, how, how does it work? So we have the paperwork, there's, there's some earnest money, and then typically what, what's the time, timeline to get, to get this done? To buy the property? Yeah. Well, if you're paying cash, which most internationals do, a lot of the properties I work with, we do have private financing options. So if you're financing a property, it can take a little bit longer because there's an appraisal and the lenders involved. A cash close can happen within two weeks. It's pretty easy. The one main thing that you want to do if you're buying one of these properties is you want to get a home inspection. So you could coordinate, you know, any home inspector to just go and you want to just make sure that you're getting what's being advertised and the inspector can do that for you. Um, so if you do that, then you agree, let's buy the house and then they send you the final paperwork and you would wire the money to them wherever it's supposed to go, escrow or whatever the instructions are. Um, so yeah, I mean a cash deal, you can close in as little as probably two weeks, maybe probably two weeks by the time you get the inspection, but it depends on where in the construction too, that the property is, because a lot of times these properties go under contract and they haven't even gotten their rehab yet. So you may, it may be a few months if you buy it preemptively um, while you're waiting on the construction of the tenant. And regarding, regarding taxes, do you know, at least from a general perspective, what can an international investor expect? Mm -hmm. I can't say what you guys can expect. I do know the process. I used to focus on international buyers. Uh, the big thing that you have to have, that you want to have in place before you put a property under contract, everything is you first need to set up your U.S. entity. Uh, it may be an LLC. I know for Canadians, LLC is not actually the way you want to go. So we have entity specialists who can, depending on which country you're buying from, they can guide you on how to get that set up. So you have to have your U.S. entity. And then in that setup, you'll get your U.S. bank account. Like they'll either coordinate it or you do it on your own. And then um, the reason to work with a specialist, in my opinion, is it's all about the taxes, kind of like you're saying is you don't want to end up getting double taxed. So mm -hmm. they're the ones who can say, okay, well, if you're coming from Portugal or you're coming from Canada or you're coming from whatever, you need this structure for the sole purpose of minimizing your tax hit. Um, so once all that's set up, then you're free to buy. And even if you have an LLC or whatever, if you're doing the private financing, they can lend to the LLC. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where I, after that, I don't know what the experience is as far as filing taxes or anything, but we have all the specialists who can help with it. And, and regarding, regarding the, regarding the, um, the rent, the rent money, how does that work? Is, is it the property manager that collects the rent checks? Yep. yep. They'll collect the rent check and then they'll direct deposit your money into your bank account, less their fee. It's usually 10% monthly, maybe 8%. 
Um, so yeah, they it just electronically shows up in your bank account. And and you do and you have an access to a report. So let's say some guy blew up the chimney or some something yep. like you, you have a report saying it's the today it's this month's rent less uh, something. Yeah, yeah. If there's a maintenance request or a repair, like when I get my statement uh, with the direct deposit, I usually get uh, access to an electronic statement, and it'll say in there maintenance whatever the fix was. Usually, if it's under a certain amount they won't ask your permission but like if he burns your chimney down they would call you first and say hey your guy burned your chimney down you know it's gonna be an expensive fix but the other thing i i didn't realize i would ever have to tell people this but if something bigger happens on the property always contact your insurance company first like more just recently i've heard of more people putting out their own cash to fix things that insurance normally would have covered just they never thought to contact their insurance company so contact insurance first, make sure they're not going to fix it before you shell out the cash. Um, but yeah, the property manager, they're the ones they'll call you and say, Hey, something happened. Uh, here's what we're going to do. And then your statement will be the rental income, less their fee and less the, whatever the cost was for that. And re regarding properties, what, what, um, where are you looking for properties right now? You invest out of state. What, what attracts you right now in the market? Well, I'm focused on, Five different markets right now, uh, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Chicago, and then Baltimore and Philly, Philadelphia. Um, the I'm working with a couple different models. The Indianapolis, Kansas City, and Chicago properties work just like I was saying. They rehab the house, they put the tenant in, and then you just buy the house, and then you have your cash flow every month. Um, Baltimore and Philly is a little bit of a different model. It's an amazing model for anyone who has the capital. Most internationals I would imagine would have the capital because for the most part you guys gonna have to buy cash anyways but it's uh, you actually put the money up for those things to be purchased the house to be purchased and then the rehab to be done and the nice thing about it is at the end of it the value of the property is higher than what you've put into it and we have guarantees in place to ensure that and all that so that one's a little bit of a different model but uh, Baltimore right now has the highest cap rates in the country so we're focused on there it's notoriously been a rougher city in the past but it's gentrifying um so we see a lot of growth potential there and it's solid enough for us to trust it you know a lot of people say oh well such and such city it's growing and we're like is it so baltimore is showing a lot of promise philadelphia has been great it's got nice cash flow it's been going strong for a few years indianapolis and kansas city are two midwestern cities chicago kind of but um the midwest is usually very staple uh, it's it's more of the suburban houses. Some people just feel more comfortable with that kind of property like Baltimore, Philly and Chicago. It's, it's more urban style row houses and some people just, you know, everyone's got preferences. So Indy and Kansas City are great for that. And then Chicago. I mean, everybody knows about Chicago. It's it's a great city. It's very stable and there's pretty nice cash flow there. It used to be a lot higher, but it's it's still going strong. Gotcha. And regarding deal flow, what do you do to get deal flow? You contact brokers, you have some, because you, you need to, to have a lot of deals and to vet them and yeah. then to choose the right ones. How do you do it? Yeah. Well, we specifically work with turnkey providers who can offer deal flow. Like a lot of people, if it's just a one-off property, that's not going to help us too much because we have so many buyers that we need them producing a lot. Okay. Um, so the guys that I work with specifically are the ones who coordinate with all of these sellers. And so the sellers are the ones who are constantly putting out, uh, properties and we have a revolving inventory on a property vault on a website that people can look at. And a lot of times they may go on there. It's not a perfect website. A lot of them, the properties all say under contract, but if you like the look of what you see, then we can get you in touch with the seller. And then that, you know, when something pops up, cause they move pretty fast. So um, when, once you're in touch with the seller, they can say, oh, okay, here we go. Here's one for you type thing. So there's always something available for sure. And, and also regarding when a tenant leaves, what's the usual time to, I know it's kind of a broad question, but what's the usually time, timing to get another guy in place? It's the tenant key provided that needs to be contacted again. How, how does that process work? Well, it's the property manager that'll coordinate all that. They'll coordinate the move out and figure out the date. And usually about, 30 days before hand, they'll start advertising the property. They'll go out, they'll set it, they'll take pictures, all that kind of stuff. And it really just depends on the market and the time of year. Like if you're trying to rent out, get tenants during Thanksgiving or Christmas here, 
like November, December, beginning of January, it's going to be hard. Like it's going to take longer because everyone's dealing with the holidays. Nobody wants to buy property, you know, move okay. right then. Uh, when school starts back, right when school starts, everything stops for a minute and then it kind of picks back up. So it's really just time of year. Um, we're as, in, as landlords or owners, we're always excited if somebody wants to leave in the spring. So it's like, Oh, great. We'll be able to get somebody a lot faster. If they want to leave during Christmas, I've actually had instances where somebody wanted to leave around Christmas time and my property manager offered them some kind of incentive to hang on for a couple of months, just for the sole fact that he knew he wouldn't be able to find somebody to move in. So it really just depends. And then, like I said, the market, um, vacancy rates kind of vary just depending, but for the most part, I mean, usually it's not more than about a month. I've had one that took as long as four months and I've had one that took as long as eight or 10 months, but that one was a horrible property manager. And when you have a good property manager, they'll make it happen. But just a word of caution on that too. A lot of people want to rush and get somebody in as fast as possible. You want a good quality tenant and all day long, it's going to be worth waiting the extra month or even waiting the extra two months to get the good tenant versus placing anybody in there. So I tell people just, you know, if it's a matter of getting the good tenant, be patient. Like it's, it's worth a couple months of vacancy to just ensure you've got someone good in because if you get a bad tenant and they destroy the house and then they leave early from the lease or they have to get evicted, like you haven't really done yourself any favors. So be patient with it, but at the same time, keep an eye on the manager and make sure that they're actually diligently trying to get somebody in there pretty timely. Gotcha. And regarding, regarding current projects, what excites you right now? What are you looking for right now? Um, well, this sounds really bad. Our business does amazing in an economy crash. <laughs> like <laughs> I don't, I don't wish a crash on, you know, anyone cause we're, we're far from a crash right now. Like we're really at the top of the markets. Prices are high. Uh, things are going really well. Uh, if we were to experience a crash right now, I would, I, well, I don't even want to say it because I would get excited for my business. I would not be excited for everybody hurting from the crash, but that's really when these kind of properties just become amazing because there's so many of them. Prices drop. You can get things so cheap. It's amazing. But for right now, while we're not in a crash, I think the Baltimore thing is really, that's exciting because where we are right now, when we were closer to the crash, there's so much appreciation potential and growing markets and whatever. And we've gotten to a point where prices are so high that the appreciation is pretty minimal across the board. Like just, you're not going to get a lot, but Baltimore actually has a lot of promise of it. The cap rates are super high. Uh, the model is really cool to work with and it's most of what we've been selling all year. So it's, it's kind of a cool one. It's different than what we're used to. And regarding for the future, you, where you see your company heading and what you're doing right now? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I don't really have a vision for it. Like I really just, what I would love to see happen is to get the message out. Like my favorite message on the planet is uh, creating the life that you want. Like I don't report to a job so I can live anywhere. I can travel and work as long as I have internet. And when you free yourself up from a corporate job or a job you have to report to or a nine to five job, I mean, life just gets exciting because you can do so much that you want. Like if you really think about working, I mean, you're spending, if you work eight hours a day, you're probably spending 10, at least, you know, getting there, getting home and then you have to decompress and like, it takes up so much of your life. And so the message I really want to get out to people is that you do have the option of trying to work yourself out of a job and where these rental properties come into play is it's all about passive income. You want to get as much income as you possibly can by not working. And so like with these properties, for example, and there's not a huge cash flow margin on them, but when you add them up and you get a big portfolio going, you can pretty quickly start replacing your income. Like, you know, if I can start replacing my rent payment with, income from something that I'm doing nothing for, I'm not working on these properties. I'm just getting money. I'm making money in my sleep. And so the more of that you can do and really free yourself up and 
So it's called lifestyle design, like designing the life that you want. And it's a little bit of a mixed message for my company because we're talking about real estate, but then if we start talking about lifestyle design, people get kind of confused about what we're talking about, but they really tie in together because real estate is one of the best ways to get yourself income and get yourself out of a job. And if you love your job, totally fine. A lot of people do. Some people wouldn't want to give it up. Then it's just great secondary income. But, you know, just, I would just love to get the message out to the world that there are possibilities and you really can make the life that you want. So how we do that, I have no idea. We just kind of keep talking about real estate in the meantime, but that's kind of what I would like us to be known for and uh, really support people in that. That's kind of what we're here for. Ellie, keep keeping us on, on the same key. If you were to go back and give some advice to your younger self, what would you say? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, you know, I don't think I would have done anything different. Uh, I have a very different mindset about life now than I did then. I remember being young, like 13, and I just wanted to make a lot of money. I was like, how am I going to do it? Like, I want to I want to make lots of money and I, I want to start a business and I want to do all this kind of stuff. And I was very, I was working for it all the time, like hardcore all the time. Now I enjoy sleeping in. I might then watch television occasionally. Like, um, I've become, I have a lot more relaxed mindset, but I don't think I necessarily would have tried to tell my younger self to do that either because it was all that work that kind of got me where I am now. But It's really just, you know, for other people and their younger selves, follow what you want to do. There's so many people trying to give advice all the time. Stand strong. If you know what you want to do and you have a dream or you have a passion, do it. Because everyone's going to tell you not to do it. And if you just stick with it and you stick to your guns, you'll, you'll go far. Gotcha. Regarding, regarding books, because I, I, I told you I'm a bookworm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so what do you like to read? What have you been reading lately? Some books that you like to share with our listeners? Well, I'll tell you, no doubt, the reason I am where I am is because of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was the very first book that I read by Robert Kiyosaki. It's kind of everybody's first book of like, oh, change in mindset about it. And I, my bookshelf is over here and I've got Uh, I have nine Rich Dad series books up there. Uh, after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I knew what he was talking about because he talks about passive income and all these things. And I, it really resonated with me. So I, once you find an author, grab it and go. And so I read, uh, as many of his as I could. And I, so much of that information has gotten me where I am now. Um, the other book, It's a little bit, well, I guess that one's not, not overly relevant. Um, I, I have books of all kinds up there. I've got four gigantic bookshelves. Um, so I'll stick with Rich Dad and Poor Dad for now. <laughs> gotcha. And, and finally, where can all listeners get a hold of you if they have any further questions? So you can always email me. It's Allie, A-L-I, at hipsterinvestments.com, H-I-P-S-T-E-R, investments. And our website is hipsterinvestments.com. And we have contact forms on there that you can reach out to us, but you can email me directly. Um, yeah. And that's it. Ali, it was a pleasure having you with us today. Hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,